everybody. Welcome to uh, the final week of our Lord's Supper ACG. Uh, for those of you in the audience here, we do have a few um, packets on the tables. Uh, I don't know if there's a, quite enough for everybody, but there's, there's roughly enough. Those are ones from last week, essentially. Those are the readings that were for last week, but I didn't have enough, so I got them for this week. We don't really have any new readings for this week. So if you got one, take one. Uh, but if you don't have one, you don't really need one. Yes. All right. Uh, people will be filing in here as we go, and that'll be all right. Uh, so since it's the last week, I just thought uh, run down what we've been over so far. Uh, we've done seven weeks here. Uh, the first week we talked about the Old Testament kind of context for uh, the Last Supper, for the words Jesus said. And we talked about things like uh, covenants, manna, the bread of the presence, uh, tabernacle sacrifices, Passover, and then just kind of bread and wine and the symbolism all through Scripture. Um, and then we got into the New Testament, and we talked about uh, you know, the Last Supper narratives again. Uh, we talked about various meals and parables that uh, Jesus was involved in during his ministry, I talked about the, the road to Emmaus after resurrection. Uh, then we also talked about 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, specifically what Paul says about uh, communion and uh, the, the early church in Acts, and then also about uh, John 6 and the bread of life discourse. And then we went into the early church, and we kind of divided up into like the before 250, after 250. Um, and so we talked about some of the, the earliest church fathers and some of the quotes and things that they talked about and the way they described the, the Eucharist. And then we talked about the changes in growth um, after Constantine came to power and uh, changes in the way, that, the kind of diversity of the interpretations um, and uh, liturgical growth and stuff of the early church. And we talked about uh, the medieval view and changes uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, and especially about uh, the growth of the doctrine of transubstantiation and Thomas Aquinas's view. And we went in detail on Thomas Aquinas and how he described that. Then we briefly talked about the Eastern Orthodox Church on how they do uh, Holy Communion. And then we went into Martin Luther, uh, his critique of the Mass and the medieval practice and uh, his positive view of uh, sacramental union. And then lastly, we talked about kind of Calvin's view, the Reformed, confessional Reformed views, and compared and contrast that with uh, Lutheran views. So that's where we've covered so far. Uh, this week, we're going to get to uh, Zwingli, uh, and the memorialist views, and talk a bit about that, compared to Reformed and, and kind of view. Um, but I'd like to hopefully get through it pretty quick, uh, not spend too much time on the, the history and stuff, because I do want to have discussion. This is our final week. I'd like to have the talks and discussion about it. Um, and I'm glad there's a lot of people here uh, in the class. There's usually a few less than this, so if you're online, uh, just know that there's more people here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Um, well, this is from last week. Uh, this is a spectrum I showed last week just as a helpful thinking about it, kind of a higher, more realistic views of Christ's presence over there and the lower, uh, more spiritual or, or uh, symbolic views over here and kind of just kind of that. I later showed up uh, another graphic that had more detail. I might show that one again. But, uh, and then we talk about the Reformed versus the Eastern. So this is all from last week. So now we're going to go on to the Zwingli and Memorialist view. So, for some of those of you who don't know, Holmfrich Zwingli, uh, that's him right there, was a very important uh, figure in the Reformation. He was a reformer in Switzerland, specifically in Zurich. Um, he lived from 1484 to 1531. And he really uh, got the Reformation kicked off in Switzerland, and so is essentially the founder of Reformed theology. Um, Calvin, obviously, is the most important theologian in the Reformed uh, tradition, and so it's often called Reformed theology or Calvinism uh, interchangeably. But Zwingli uh, got started 15, 20 years before Calvin and really kind of kicked it off. So uh, he became the people's priest of Zurich in 1519, uh, and as soon as he was priest, he began, immediately began preaching through the entire New Testament, like starting with Matthew, and went all the way through. He had er Erasmus's New Greek uh, New Testament, and... Uh, that was, that was a different thing. People didn't really do that and didn't preach that way at the time. Uh, and then in Lent, 1522, Lent was connected in with a bunch of, like, uh, the 
the state and restrictions on what you could eat and a bunch of different things at the time. So he uh, rejected that and had everyone uh, held a, a sausage dinner. Um, <laughs> and it was a big controversial <laughs> event. Uh, and that was the, the first start of the Reformation in Switzerland really got going there. Um, so that 1519, you know, Luther uh, publishes uh, 95 theses, right, in 1517. So Zwingli is getting started right after, and he's over in Switzerland, and he's kind of, he's not actually following on from Luther necessarily. He really kind of comes to it his own way, and he reads Luther and is kind of in, interested in him, but he's not, they come to things in different directions. Um, so then uh, once he gets into, there's a Swiss diet disputation of 1523 is when he first critiques the mass, among other things. Um, some of his closest associates, if you ever think of wh who else was like Zwingli and had his view, Leo Judd, Johannes Ecolampadius, um, were two of the figures who would. And uh, so some of the, we're going to get to his theology just in the next slide, but he introduced a new liturgy, um, and then, then another one uh, a couple years later. So changing the way, uh, kind of rejecting the mass and trying to reformulate it in a way that would fit more reformed theology. Um, so some of the things he did was he introduced distributing the elements to people at their seats. Uh, so he would actually bring in tables for communion, and everyone would kind of sit down at the tables, and then he would, they would have servers come around and distribute it to people at the seats. Uh, in the early church, everyone stood. There weren't any chairs or pews uh, for the first, like, thousand years, basically. Um, and then in the Middle Ages, they started to bring in uh, pews, and, but still people would come up to receive. Usually in, in the Catholic Mass, they would, would kneel and then receive it on their tongue. Uh, the priest would just place it into their mouths. Um, for Zwingli, it's more a meal. It's more communal. Everyone should sit around and pass it around among them. Uh, and then, as we talked about uh, before, in 1529, there's a colloquy of Marburg where Zwingli and Luther met and tried to come to an agreement. Zwingli really thought they could and thought, like, yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to come to agreement. I can convince Luther. It'll be all right. He thinks he doesn't agree with me, but we can convince. And Luther came to it like, no way I'm going to be convinced by this guy. <laughs> and uh, it did not go well. Um, and so ultimately it was a break, and there's kind of a split between the Lutherans and the Reformed there. Uh, and then he died uh, in a battle in 1531, um, which I think he was, he was a, a, a chaplain, but he also might have been armed. I don't know if they had the same division between chaplains and non combatants in England. Anyway, so that's, that's who he is. So I'll talk more about his theology of, of the Eucharist. So, against Rome and Luther, Zwingli um, would argue several things. So one, he would say, when Jesus says, this is my body, is means signifies. Uh, for Luther, this is an adamant point of is means is. Uh, Jesus is giving his last will and testament before he goes to die. He's talking very literally and specifically and explaining things to his followers. Uh, there's no reason for him to talk in parables or, or allegories. But for Zwingli, no, it, it, there's a lot of different places in the Bible where um, people will say, and maybe Jesus will say, this is something or other. I, you know, I am the door. Um, is he really a literal door, or is he talking figuratively? Uh, so for Zwingli, is means signifies, so you should not take it to be too literal. Um, he also argued that Basic, a really important point is that Christ, once he, after the resurrection, he ascends to heaven. He is no longer present on earth in his body. And he repeatedly says things like, I will not remain in the world any longer. Or when Mary Magdalene uh, comes and, and like hugs him or something, he's like, do not hold on to me, for I am leaving. Uh, so for Zwingli, it's really important that his body was here, it lived and died, historical fact, but then he went to heaven, and he's no longer here, and he's going to come again, literally and physically, but he's not here presently. So for Thomas Aquinas, uh, it was a really important thing that Christ is still present in the Eucharist in a very substantial way, and this is the way that he's elected to be present with us continuously uh, in the age of the church. But for Zwingli, he's like, well, he's spiritually kind of present, but he isn't physically, and so we shouldn't think of it that way. Um, also, he looks at the, in, in the Bread of Life Discourse, the, the key verse uh, Zwingli would look at to define the whole thing is the spirit gives life, the flesh avails nothing. So there's, 
when Christ is talking about eat my flesh, he's not really talking about eat my flesh. He's talking about the spirit. The spirit nourishes. Um, and he's the, the human flesh of Christ doesn't really do anything for us in that way. Uh, obviously, he died and rose again, and so there's atonement, but it doesn't, it doesn't feed us. It's the spirit. And then another thing he says is that he's an axiom. Uh, that, so he, you don't argue for an axiom. You just state it and use it. The finite cannot contain the infinite, uh, definitionally. So if the finite cannot contain the infinite, then Christ, the, the, in, the infinite God-man, uh, cannot be contained within bread and wine. Um, it just, it, it's impossible. So that was his main critique there. As for his positive uh, arguments for the, the Eucharist and what, what it does, um, I can see my notes. Um, so do this in remembrance of me and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Those are the primary uh, words that describe what's going on in, in uh, communion. You're, it's a remembrance, and we're proclaiming the Lord's death. That, what else do you need? That is really clearly and specifically the doctrine of, um, of what, what should, what's going on. We are remembering Christ's death, and we are proclaiming it and keeping it alive and, and uh, speaking it loud. Uh, he actually preferred the word Eucharist over communion and Lord's Supper. Um, I feel like today we think of Eucharist as being more of a Catholic word. Uh, for him, I mean, Eucharist means Thanksgiving. Uh, so he thought, he wasn't sure about, you know, how much do we commune with the body of Christ, the Holy Communion, but, but Eucharist, we give thanks. So that, that actually was a preferable term to Sue Zwingli, uh, where Calvin preferred the term Lord's Supper to emphasize um, Christ actually being the one who instituting it and inviting us to his table with him. Talk about that. Um, the word sacrament. Uh, he pointed out that originally sacramentum in the old Latin uh, meant taking a pledge or an oath. Uh, when when uh, Roman soldiers uh, would join up to the military, they would take a special pledge or oath that initiated them into uh, the military. So if, if we're talking about sacraments, we should see them as pledges or oaths that we take to, uh, to explain our allegiance to Christ, uh, to assert from all. Uh, assert isn't quite the right word. We're all making a pledge together that we are part of the body of Christ. And so he sees it as a, uh, the congregation making together and the congregation being bound together in the body of Christ. So the body of Christ is primarily for him the congregation and we pledge together, we bound together. Um, and he would say, you know, the traditional way of talking about sacraments are visible signs of invisible grace. And he would say, yes, uh, Christ died for us in the past, and that grace was poured out, and this is a sign of that past grace. But it isn't directly connected uh, in any particular way, aside from its symbolic. Um, and, but it does impress on our hearts and senses and strengthens our faith. Uh, so... The centrality for him is faith. Nothing can get in the way of being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, um, including things Jesus told us to do. It's, that would be, uh, it, it's all about faith. And it's not about the symbols so much. The symbols just help our faith. They help us think and remember and recall what Jesus has done for us. So, um, and sacraments are, they're really important for the things they proclaim the way they witness the one who instituted them, the way their analogies of truly sacred things. So the Christ's body and blood on the cross really did save us. And so these are symbols of Christ's body and blood, and we should recall that and remember that and, and hold on to that very strongly. So he would say he does not reject that Christ is present in the supper in, in a way. He, in his view, he doesn't. Because, um, I guess that's cat. Uh, you eat, <laughs> you eat the body of Christ spiritually, though not sacramentally. Every time you comfort your heart in this anxious query, um, so for him, if you're you're worried in your heart, am I truly saved? Am I uh, good enough? Am I uh, really part of the kingdom of Christ? If I think on Christ and what He did for me, and I comfort my heart and remember I have assurance in Him, and that's the same as eating. That's eating Christ. That's partaking of Him. That's receiving Him into your heart. Um, 
And uh, so that's spiritual eating of Christ. And sometimes we also take a sacrament and a symbol to help us remember. And so we eat sacramentally as well as spiritually. And so that's kind of, so he, in his view, uh, there, is, there is some sense of partaking. But for him, uh, eating is believing. If you believe, you are eating. That's the, uh, of, of Christ. Uh, in, in John 6, that's what Jesus meant. So that's his uh, basic basic view. Any questions about that? Yes. Um, I understand that the Quakers mm -hmm. do not use the symbols mm -hmm. at all. I wonder if this statement of Swingley could be something they go back to. Mm, it might be. Believe, believing is eating. Yeah, yeah. I think there might be some truth to that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know a lot of details about the, the Quaker view and how it get there, but I would bet I do know that they emphasize that inner light above all else, and it, symbols that just can get in the way, yeah. focusing on that inner light. Yeah. So I was um, uh, kind of interested a few weeks ago when you were talking about the early church view and had examples mm -hmm. from different people like Irenaeus and mm -hmm. whatnot, and and I was sort of surprised at how. Um, uniform the early church was on taking a more literal view mm -hmm. of, of uh, the, the body and blood. Um, and I, but I'm, I also, um, well, so I, I wonder, was there anybody in particular in the early church or any particular early church documents that Swingley would look back to, or does he just skip over all of it and go to uh, to the Bible and, and to how he's interpreting that? Yeah, I think he, he argues that he's basically saying what Augustine said. Uh, everyone says they're saying what Augustine said. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think he is. <laughs> I'll be honest. But, uh, but he, there are a few quotes from Augustine where, where, I mean, Augustine will say, separate the sign and the thing signified. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, you know, uh, if, it, well, if there's some quote where he's like, believe and you have eaten. Uh, there's some line where he says that. So uh, Zwingli will a quote, like three or four Augustine quotes repeatedly, but he won't necessarily go into a detail and description of here's exactly how my view lines up with the thing. Um, I think there are a couple other places you could look in the early church to sort of support it, but I don't know that he did. Okay. Personally. Um, so as we, we've talked about, uh, so Zwingli's ideas uh, grew and were part of like the Reformed view, and then Calvin came along, uh, 10 years later, and, and along with Martin Butzer, and tried to find a, a mediating view between Zwingli and Luther. And so they end up with kind of something closer to Luther in some ways than to Zwingli. Uh, Calvin, especially early on, was like, this view of Zwingli is, is pernicious. <laughs> it's, it's really a problem. It's, it, it, we need to, we can't trust it. Um, but on the other hand, he thought there were some of the things that uh, Zwingli said up here that were actually accurate. So there, there was this kind of a trying to find a view that could unite everybody. Um, so the, the Zwingli's theology here, I want to talk a little bit about how it spreads, because it isn't just spread in uh, the Reformed churches. Because um, once, once Calvin comes along and, and they come out with a bunch of the main confessions, as we talked about last week, the main confessions mainly take uh, Calvin's view. But um, other people take Zwingli's view, particularly the Anabaptists. So the Anabaptists, they break from... Zwingli in Switzerland and Zurich and uh, from uh, from Luther in Germany, they kind of there's radical groups that kind of break off from the Reformation uh, in different places around Europe, um, and of course their main uh, theology theological difference is they reject infant baptism. They say it must be adult believers baptism, and uh, the Anabaptists get persecuted by everybody. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot of things, but they take also Zwingli's basic view of of um, the Lord's Supper. And, uh, but, but even push it even a little further. There is no sort of sacramental presence. It is all about uh, remembrance, but it's also all about community. And you need to be a baptized believer uh, to be part of this community and, and partake of uh, communion. But you have to be an adult baptized believer. You have to have uh, professed belief and then be baptized. So no one who is uh, baptized in an infant is allowed to come to their communion. Um, so that's partly why it was shocking and, and to a lot of people. Uh, so the Schleitheim Confession uh, refers to just the breaking of bread. Things like that's the biblical term in Acts, uh, so the breaking of bread. Of course, uh, I, 
I think Eucharist and Lord's Supper are also biblical terms. And Paul specifically calls it the Lord's Supper, and the Eucharist just means Thanksgiving, and right, Jesus blesses or gives thanks for the uh, um, the bread and the wine before handing it out, so it's the word is Eucharistia there. But they use the breaking of bread, um, and that's what they emphasize. And of course, the Anabaptists today are the Mennonites and the Amish and uh, Hutterites and, and those groups, if you don't, haven't heard of them. Um, other groups are the Baptists. Uh, so the Baptists are different from the Anabaptists. They're influenced by them, but they are a separate group. They break off later, more in the 1600s, especially uh, in England. Um, they, they have a variety of views. So if you look at, say, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, that confession is very much modeled on the Westminster Confession, which is a big Reformed Presbyterian uh, view from the mid-1600s, uh, except that they change the stuff on baptism. Uh, is the main thing that they change, and also the stuff on um, the relation between the, the church and the state. Uh, so they actually, so if you have a 1689 Baptist, they will say, you know, we have a high view of uh, communion. Um, but the rest of Baptists mostly take a more Zwinglian view and emphasize, uh, you know, this do in remembrance of me, that's, that's a, you'll see that in a lot of different churches, but especially Baptist churches will have, the, the, that's the table of Christ, and it will say, this do in remembrance on me. And, it, and they, uh, I mean, they take it seriously. It's not like it's, a, I'm not trying to break it down in any way, but um, they reject the language of sacrament and say ordinance instead a lot of times. Um, so, and that, they would argue that that is actually higher. If sacrament kind of means symbol, sacred symbol in a way. Then ordinance is something that God has ordained that we do. This is uh, an obligation on all of us. But it also turns it into something we do obligation rather than something God gives to us. Um, so it changes the dynamic. Um, you also see a spread of, of this view more and more uh, after the Second Great Awakening. So in the early 1800s in America, you have all sorts of uh, revival movements that go in a lot of different directions. And some of them are Methodists and some of them are Presbyterians, but there's also Baptists. Uh, there's also break-off Methodist groups that are Wesleyan holiness movement, uh, Adventists, various evangelical movements. Um, and a lot of those are, you know, very low church and emphasize a more Zwinglian view of, of the supper. Um, one group is specifically is the Stone Campbell movement or the Restorationists. So they want to restore the early church, the, the, the New Testament church. They want to go back to the New Testament church. The later church brought in things like creeds and confessions, and that divides people. There is no creed but the Bible. That's their slogan. Um, which, if you take that slogan really seriously, really long time... Uh, a creed, but uh, <laughs> but it, there's no creed but the Bible, so that'd be the, the churches of Christ, disciples of Christ, Christian churches, um, those groups come off, off of the Restorationist movement, and they want their primitive church, um, so they will say things like, they'll, they'll follow, uh, in Acts, it seems like uh, the early church breaks bread every time they get together, so they uh, did try and restore um, weekly communion, and they did, you know, emphasize, take it seriously, um, but also in a, in a Zwinglian way. So it is, it is primarily about remembrance. It's primarily about community. Um, and then you also have the temperance movement. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on that, but that's uh, kind of interesting because then, then there's, uh, in the 1800s, there, there's this movement against um, alcohol. Uh, and so then what do you do with communion wine? Do you keep taking wine in communion? And some people didn't. And some people, there were, there were definitely some revival groups that would just just took water instead. Uh, there were other uh, rival groups that did try and take some things like uh, must. Basically, uh, they found they, they would uh, crush grapes and it would be juice, but before it fermented. Um, so must or mustum, that's, that's a term for that. And uh, there, there are ways, that, and then you boil some water, try, try and have uh, grape juice before it's fermented. Um, and Methodist Thomas Bramwell Welch uh, introduced pasteurized grape juice in 1869. So yes, Welch's grape juice, very specifically uh, because he was a communion server and a teetotaler uh, and wanted, uh, wanted grape juice that was not alcoholic. So he introduces that uh, unfermented juice uh, in the 1860s, 70s and turned it into a giant business uh, to this day. So... If you're wondering when did they start first having grape juice instead of wine, that that's when, um, and so that spread all over to all the all the churches of Protestant churches in America that became to support the temperance movement. 
which came Methodists especially, but also Presbyterians, Holiness churches, uh, independent Bible churches, Baptists. Uh, Lutherans and Catholics did not support it and continued using wine, um, but most other churches started adopting uh, grape juice. As a, as a random thing, uh, so I was wondering, like, so is that allowed? What did the early church think? Uh, if you, that is, I mean, it is a really uh, complicated question, but um, that, that idea of must, that grape juice that still has all the flesh of the grape and the stems and everything in it, but it's been smushed, um, is allowable in extreme circumstances in like Roman Catholicism, Thomas Aquinas addresses it, and like if it's absolutely necessary, yeah, you could use that, I guess so. Um, and he cites uh, Pope Julius the first in the 300s has a statement allowing that. So there is some sense that it could possibly be allowed, but there's also a very strong sense that the fermented uh, wine, the alcoholic kind of is actually part of the symbolism, part of the meaning, and it ideally should be there. So that, that's kind of the traditional view. Um, we can also talk about, you know, there's, there's kind of a gradual shift away from Calvin's view in just Reformed theology in general. So I have a book here called uh, Given for You, Reclaiming Calvin's Doctrine of the Lord's Supper by Keith Masseson, uh, forward by R.C. Sproul. This, Pastor Dan gave this to me. It's a really good book. I really recommend it. Um, and so he, he describes what Calvin's doctrine is and then talks about shift away from Calvin's doctrine in among form theology um, and breaks it down for the day. Um, and it's really, it's, does not, you don't have to be a specialist to read it. It's really good. Um, so you can see kind of uh, even form scholastics in the 1600s like Francis Turretin to Puritans like Ezekiel Hopkins to later evangelicals like Jonathan Edwards kind of gradually move further and further away from Calvin. Uh, they emphasize uh, the mind uh, in what do, these are visible words to us, the sacraments, and we receive them with our mind and understand them, and that is partaking of them. So that's kind of becomes the, the shift towards that. And Jonathan Edwards takes pretty much a Zwinglian view of, of communion. Um, another thing, just we're not going to spend time on it, but uh, which also Pastor Dan gave me a book on, on this debate um, the, between Charles Hodge and John Williamson. That, Charles Hodge was the most important theologian of Princeton Theological Seminary throughout for like 50, 60 years in the 1800s. Um, and so he's hugely influential on evangelicalism and uh, reformed thought in his time. Uh, but he takes something that's closer to Zwingli than to Calvin as his view. And John Williamson Nevin is a German reformed theologian uh, known as part of the Mercersburg theology. And he uh, critiques it in art and uh, writes a book that kind of critiques the whole church in America <laughs> uh, and argues for the, the mystical presence. We need to restore the mystical presence because that, he argues, is Calvin's view and the original Reformed confessional view. Uh, and Hodge rejects that, and there's a back and forth. Uh, so John Williamson have another of Pastor Dan's um, theological heroes. Uh, but Hodge's view basically prevails over the next few decades and into the, into the 20th century, and it's only in the last... The second half of the 20th century, there is a shift back. So a lot of theologians in a lot of different areas uh, have been trying to recover uh, Calvin's view and have trying to... This, this debate was only an academic debate that no one really paid attention to at the time, but now it's become seen as a really quintessential debate uh, between different factions in uh, theology in America. So um, that's mean the big history that I wanted to go through. Uh, would note that for evangelicals, um, I have that image there, the Great Awakening does actually have its roots in, in communion in some ways. Um, in uh, the Scottish Presbyterians and Welsh churches, when they, they would only have communion quarterly, which was, Zwingli was like, quarterly is all you need, that makes sense. Uh, and, but they would have everyone come together, uh, like from across, around the countryside would come together and they would set out big tables and they would have uh, preaching for, for hours for, and sometimes for days uh, to prepare people to receive communion together. And so it was so central in that moment and in that time to receiving communion together in that communal way uh, that it really, that kind of fed into the revivalism that uh, later started happening because the camp meetings grew out of that kind of coming together for communion. 
Um, I'd also know that even uh, during this time, well, there's a shift towards a low church um, that kind of takes away from, in some ways, the, the piety around communion. So you, had, you used to have in like the 1600s, 1700s, uh, books of like meditations on, on, on the Holy Supper. Uh, and they would be by high church Anglicans or, you know, low church Puritans, but they would still be all about meditating on uh, the supper. The Puritans had a mixed view. A lot of them had a very high view of communion. They would preach sermons all about it and how uh, important it was and how Christ meets us in the, in the supper and spiritually nourishes us. Um, and you'd have, you know, the Wesleys, Charles Wesley wrote multiple hymns about coming to communion, their communion hymns, and John Wesley had sermons all about it. Um, and Charles Spurgeon, Baptist theologian, 1699, uh, Baptist confession, really had a high view, and he had sermons all about it. So there is this evangelical people who have very high view of the supper, who really emphasize it in sermons and, and uh, writings and uh, hymns, but there's also this other general trend, lower in a way, that just emphasizes this communal aspect. So, um, my, uh, now I'm going to get a little more, well, I'm, I'm trying to be objective, but I also I'm going to, I'm, I'm sure, tipping my hand here. It's the last one, so I want to uh, push for my interpretation. So, <laughs> we're going to have some of the arguments of the memorialist view uh, versus then kind of the magisterial Protestant response. So, kind of, by mag Zwingli is technically a magisterial Protestant, but I'm just talking about Calvin, uh, Thomas Cranmer, a little bit of Luther, Philip Melanchthon, uh, and, and, and Wesley, all that kind of response to some of these, these objections. So is means signifies, Luther wouldn't disagree, but Calvin would say, yes, well, this is still a mystery, for signs participate in the things they signify, especially when uh, they're instituted by Christ. They are connected to the things they signify, they aren't just bare new signs. Do this in remembrance of me? Everyone agrees with that. Um, everyone agrees, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, whatever, that we remember <laughs> Christ in the Supper. That there is even like a little section of the liturgy in those churches that it's the anamnesis, the remembrance. Um, but is that all? Is that all that's going on? Uh, we would say, you know, it's memorial. It's like Passover. We remember, they remembered what Christ did, or what, sorry, what uh, the Passover, the Exodus from Egypt uh, in the Old Testament. But Passover was a sacrifice, and the victim was eaten. Uh, they sacrificed a new lamb every year at Passover, and they ate it in their homes, and that was part of uh, what's going on there. So likewise, uh, communion is a sacrificial meal that applies the cross to us. So Christ gives himself. He is the, the sacrifice for us, and he is the high priest offering himself in the sacrifice. But... It is then applied to us. Uh, the lamb was taken home uh, to the people's houses, and there they ate and remembered. Uh, and that is what is kind of going on in uh, Passover. And for, I mean, for Calvin, he would say, uh, in the supper we are made partakers of the death and passion of Jesus Christ. And in communicating in his body, we have part in the sacrifice which he offered on the cross to God the Father. So the sacrifice is applied to us, which is also how sacrifices usually worked in the Old Testament, um, you ate of the sacrifice, uh, elicit a bit of the sacrifice, and that incorporated you into uh, the benefits of it. So, finite can't contain the infinite, that, that quotation. Um, Calvin would say, yeah, I, God isn't contained in finite things. He isn't contained in the bread, uh, but God can appoint means to convey himself in his grace. So he reaches into our material world and, and appoints means. And he connects spiritually himself to those means to, um, and gives us a promise with them uh, to, to benefit us spiritually. So it isn't this absolute division between spirit and matter. Uh, there are means. Uh, eating equals believing. Calvin would say eating is a consequence of belief. Faith enables us to feed on Christ. So in John 6, uh, in this bread life discourse, if we believe, Christ will feed us on his flesh and blood. Um, so it, it is not the same as believing. It's not just every time we believe, we are nourished, and that's it. Uh, it is an ongoing sanctification through the feeding and nourishing spiritually, uh, if we believe and if we have faith to receive that nourishment. Sacraments are pledges we make uh, versus uh, 
uh, for the you know, professional pride, this is sacraments are pledges God makes to us. They are a means he is appointed and pledged to us to, for us to receive. Uh, so it, it, the promise is connected to the, the, the thing, the signifier, and we receive it. And it's not so much about us pledging. That doesn't mean we can't, and that doesn't mean there is an important element of us reaffirming our faith. That is absolutely important. But that's not the primary point of what's going on. And then the congregation is bound together into the body of Christ. Yes, absolutely. The congregation is the body of Christ. The, the whole church is the body of Christ. But this only happens because we are first bound to Christ. So in 1 Corinthians 10, I'm forgetting the verse, but uh, Paul says, um, the bread that we break is a uh, participation or uh, partaking of Christ's body. The the cup that we bless is a participation in the blood of Christ. And then, so that's first, and then he says, because we break one bread uh, and all partake of one bread, then we are one body. So there's a vertical movement first. We are connected to Christ. And then there is the horizontal movement that connects us all to uh, each other in the church. So because we are connected to Christ, then we are also connected to each other as the body of Christ. Um, there's a lot more we could uh, go into. Priesthood of all believers versus uh, need a minister to stand in Christ's place and claim his words to us. Uh, if, you're, if Jesus is distributing uh, the elements to his disciples he, in saying the words, then whoever is doing, being the minister needs to take his place and say his words and distribute uh, from him. And so it's, it's Christ's sacrifice and it's his words uh, but someone is distributing it and relaying his words, proclaiming his words to us, and giving us his visible words in the sacraments. Um, and, yeah, so there's, there's, there's more I could say there, but I think that's the big, the big points um, that I want to make. That would be the, the kind of the official, the, this is, again, this is not a five-point Calvinist uh, view. This is, this is Calvin's view and Wesley's view and, and, Cranmer's view and uh, a broad Protestant swath uh, view versus the Zwinglian view. So, um, and then here's my uh, my graph again, my uh, uh, visual aid, which is cluttered up, so it's probably confusing. Um, but if we have Luther's view over there, Zwingli's view over here, Anabaptist here, a little further than Zwingli, and then Quakers and Salvation Army, because they just jettison it entirely. Um, Kind of where where are they? Uh, the Reformed Confessions, the Methodist Articles of Religion, they're right in here. They in between Calvin and, and Zwingli, take in Calvin's views. Wes, Wesley's here, Charles Spurgeon there. I and this is don't take this absolutely seriously. This is my uh, attempt to graph it. You know, no, this isn't how people do it. Um, but also like the Book of Common Prayer uh, <clears throat> takes in the Calvin and maybe goes a little further and leaves a little room for a higher view than Calvin. But it it's basically a cran. Uh, I mean, Thomas Cranmer wrote the Book of Common Prayer. It's basically his view. He's basically a uh, reformed view. Um, one thing we could say that I uh, haven't gotten into is it's just kind of like um, liturgical setting of how, how uh, the supper would be set. And so, of course, the low church removes more and more of a liturgical setting and it just emphasizes, um, you know, say the words of institution and uh, uh, think in your heart about how you would about, about what Christ has done for you and prepare yourself for communion. So there's a lot of seriousness. I don't want to emphasize that there isn't any seriousness to it, but there isn't a much uh, symbolism and ceremony. Um, and Calvin actually didn't add much ceremony. He took he stripped a lot of ceremony away. So he didn't necessarily put the ceremony into his, his theology. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer, I think, personally, does a very good job of maintaining continuity with the early church and also at the same time taking a Protestant view um, and still combines it all together. Uh, and here's my, uh, my contentious argument uh, symbol here. Um, I would argue that the high Calvinist view, the Lutherans, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, all are trying to get at the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist in some way, even though they disagree with each other on a lot of different things. Um, I think that is the primary view of the early church, and all of them are trying to be in continuity with it uh, the way they understand I think the memorialist view is essentially not in continuity with that. So, 
that is my contentious argumentative thing, and uh, we can open up for uh, discussion here after this. So, Dad? <laughs> in your church experience, yes, <laughs> in your young life, uh -huh. uh, where would you put your the practice of communion uh, that you I was going to ask you guys that <laughs> on this graph. I would say it's kind of this direction. Did you have a question, Jerry? Yeah, you kind of answered it. I was I wonder how you seem to assume that the biblical phrase breaking of bread mm. means communion, because in Acts 2, I took that as a church potluck where you kind of all eat together. Mm. Um, but in 1 Corinthians 10, it does seem to be synonymous with communion. Do you think it's always synonymous with communion? There is at least one time when Paul in Acts it says breaks bread and then he just eats himself, and everyone else is like reassured, and they eat, and it's like after the shipwreck. Um, so that doesn't seem to be necessarily communion. Um, the other times, the two or three times in Acts, uh, when it says that like the church gathers together to break bread and worship, and uh, it, it just it seems like that's that is the primary meaning there. Um, that's what's going on. But there's not like it's not like that many times in the scripture. So. So like church. <laughs> well, I think, so I did talk about in, like, the early church New Testament classes about um, the ideas of uh, the, the fellowship meal, the love feast, and how that was connected in the early church to communion, and they probably were all part of the same thing, but they gradually become detached. And so there was something different about eating together versus also uh, the specifically blessing of a bread, one loaf and one cup. And that, I mean, Paul specifically says we all partake of one bread. And that's why we're one body. But then he also talks about as if everyone's eating together a full meal. So it seems like there's something, a specific blessing that takes place, and then there's also a full meal. And But they, they were detachable, apparently. Yeah? Would that be more consistent with how Jewish folks celebrated Passover? Like when you celebrated Passover, you didn't just have the one sip of wine and the mm -hmm. one piece of bread. You had a meal together. Right. Yeah, and so there's like four cups of wine. Yeah. that if they saw this as Redefining Passover, mm -hmm. that it would be a meal. It yeah. wouldn't just be a one time thing. Mm -hmm. A little sip and a little piece of bread. Doesn't it, does it make sense that it would be that it would be connected? Yeah. The the other thing is, I mean, for Passover, it's only once a year, right. but they were they were doing it like every time they met. Yeah. So I, every Sunday. So it was it is different in some ways. Um, and there is it is still I, I don't wanna I think it's, it's directly from Passover, but I, there is still a contentious of, was the last meal actually Passover meal, or was it something else? And so there's, there's a bunch of debate about the early church on that issue. Um, but I do, yeah, it does seem like um, within the first hundred years, they were detaching the two, and gradually the, the love feast fellowship meal kind of died out uh, after a few hundred years because it became more of a, a celebration uh, where people might get drunk or things like that, and it'd be in the evening uh, where they would usually have uh, the Eucharist in the morning. Um, so there was just kind of a gradual, they were seen as two different things that were stuck together, but didn't have to be. Oh. Yeah, Lois. Um, almost since the beginning of the class, I've been thinking about the principle of trying to interpret scripture in the way that the original hearer mm -hmm. would understand it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, at the last, at the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. how would the disciples have understood? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean they they did not think they were eating the flesh of Christ. Right. Is that and that becomes a, yeah a real question. Um, you know, for Thomas Aquinas, he would say right then when he says this is my body, it became his body. Uh, um, and hand it around. At least one Lutheran who I read uh, was like, well, no, obviously it didn't become it at, his, that at the Last Supper. It's just afterwards that